It's time to go live at Lucian Live 2022 in Denver, Colorado, April 10th through 13th at the Denver Convention Center. Discover the innovative solutions, transformative insights, and strong connections to help you lead through change. Register at elucian.com slash elucian live and catch Elvin and I recording on site live. We can't wait to see all of you. It's time. Lead Squared is a cutting edge CRM platform for enrollment management. With Lead Squared, you will deliver a seamless student experience, streamline admissions processes, lower costs, and increase retention. Schedule a demo at leadsquared.com. Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to EdUp on the EdUp Experience podcast, where we make education your business. Uh, I can't tell you how excited I am today, guys. Got a great guest, one of the best. I mean, he's simply one of the best, most eloquent higher ed speakers you'll ever come across. I know this because I've interviewed him before, and I follow him all over social media, stalk him probably, although yeah. we won't use the stalking word. Uh, somebody that's stalking me lately, John Farrar, he is... Today, my special guest co-host, he's not really stalking me. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, oh that's the wrong button, John. I'm sorry about that. Let me, let me try that again. John Ferrara, welcome back to the Up Experience. Thanks for co-hosting with me again, man. Uh, Joe, it's always good to be back with you. And I would have thought your, your schedule is pretty busy these days, but it looks like you've had enough time to research a bunch of other uh, sound effects uh, in the interim of moving from the, the West Coast to the Midwest. So it's wrong. Uh, I had this stored... <laughs> I have these stored up in a bank of 30,000 sound effects. Pick the appropriate ones just for you, John. That, that wasn't for you, but I, I am testing out some new buttons. You're always a good sport, I have to tell you. Uh, well, look, yeah, it, that's, my, that's my one attribute that I add to the show here. Um, but thanks for having me back on. But I think uh, you should uh, maybe introduce the eloquent speaker that um, you alluded to earlier, and it's not that's me. me. <laughs> Stop, Thank you for that transition for to push me along here, John. I appreciate it. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as I said, he needs no introduction. His name is Dr. Gregory Fowler, and he's president of the University of Maryland Global Campus. Greg, what is happening? How's it going? Glad to be here. Glad to be back, and nice to uh, spend some time with you guys. You're back, my friend. Thank you for, for thank you for coming. It's such an honor to have you here. Whenever, especially when uh, we have guests. That are, that are such a high level, right? That are going from one amazing place to another amazing place. Uh, we kind of think that's like, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. He's going from, you know, he, Southern New Hampshire and your past roles. You've worked for two of the largest universities in the world at this point. Now you come to University of Maryland Global Campus, which I'm sure will be there soon. What does that transition look like during COVID times? Uh, and because it's not like you can just wrap up everything and all your successes and walk into a new place. There's new people that's masks and, and all of a sudden we're now at the back end of a pandemic, knock on wood. And now things are normalizing. So is life just changing in phases for you? What's this look like? Well, you know, I um, will say this. I think that in truth, there are both benefits and disadvantages to um, the way that things have transpired during the pandemic. Um, one of the challenges of course, is trying to move into a new location with all of the limitations of, who can come into the office, who's out of the office, who's able to travel for those types of things. But it also gives you a way of sort of easing into some of these aspects of being in a new leadership role. Whereas in many other instances, particularly with the state institution, um, you'd have a lot of running down to the state capital, Annapolis. A lot of that work was able to be done through Zoom. A lot of the meetings were able to do things without that I was able to do in this way. And so as a result, it gave me a chance to sort of settle in a little bit at a time. And as a result, now we are feeling for the first time that that feeling of things getting back to some sense of here's what the rhythm is going to be. Had my first testimony in front of the legislature a couple of weeks ago. That was fun. I'm sure um, you thought I just that's one thing that I'm sure was on your list of things that you wanted to do in your life, right? You, you know, it's not like the congressional hearings you see on TV. So um, it, it's a lot easier than um, you think in Yikes! some ways if you if you plan for it ahead of time. So that was absolutely a good thing. Now, I will say to your other point, though, that having been at several institutions, one of the things that's been interesting about this transition is that I'm now convinced that while we all think about online education as this sort of package thing, the three places I have been at are extremely different from each other. And we can talk a little bit more about that as we continue to go along. But uh, we think about online education as this sort of uh, distance uh, experience that people go through. 
And WGU was very different from SNHU. SNHU is very different from UMGC, both in their origins, in the way that they work with students, even in the modalities and the content that they have. So very interesting to always have a learning in front of you of something that's coming along. Yeah, you know, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I can't tell you how many times that does come up in conversations with people where, you know, especially people that don't understand online learning to the, to the same level as you might. They go, oh, well, you're at one school and you go to this school. It's the same thing, online learning. It's delivered the same. It's packaged the same. And you've worked now for three very different looking large online institutions. Talk about some of those intricacies, if you will. If you can point out anything that kind of sticks out, you go, these are differences. Sure. I mean, the first big one, of course, is that, as you know, WTU was founded um, and uh, built around an idea of competency-based education in a certain type of form. So it's not the direct assessment model that College for America at SNHU is built around, which is a different type of model. Online education at those two institutions tends to be direct to consumer as the sort of base model. Um, UMGC is not. Um, UMGC, we're celebrating our 75th anniversary, and it was founded um, specifically to deal with military students uh, returning, first of all, from World War II in Europe at the time. And over time became, and it, of course it was, we think everybody thinks about it now as an online institution, but we didn't do online institution work, online work until 1993, 1994. Uh, we sent students, um, we worked with our faculty members going overseas to Europe, to Asia, to the Middle East uh, during that period of time. Most of those experiences were face-to-face -face or hybrid experiences in other parts of the world. Um, so we were the first to actually have faculty members in an active battle zone, for example. Uh, students literally talk about bombs falling or things happening where they literally are in class and the alarms go off. They have to you know, go into the bunker. Um, there are bombs falling outside and then they get back up and go back into class. Um, a lot of the pictures that are here around the office are pictures of students studying on a beach um, where the faculty members in front of them are, are studying on a tank is another one I'm looking at right now um, across from me in the office or in the jungles. And you have all these various ways that we had to meet students where they were, both literally, and now we talk about that in some figurative ways. How do we think about different types of experiences and how do we make those happen for the students is at the core of that. But that's a different experience than creating a direct-to-consumer model of online education that's at SNHU or the competency-based model that's at WGU, all of which are trying to do the same things, but do them in very different ways and have different dynamics as a result. John, before I pass it to you, because I got your text that you want to jump in and, and get me off the microphone, so note received. But, but um, why did you, Greg, why did you make this shift? What was it about UMGC that made you go, yes, I, I'm going here, I'm taking me, myself, my family, my environment, my, and, and I'm making a new life for myself in this environment. There must have been something special there. Well, I think, um, as you know, and I, I was having a conversation just last night with a colleague and we were talking about the unique nature of higher education. And there are many places where people think about it as a competition, but there's also a huge amount of collaboration. And so UMGC, SNHU, WGU, uh, we've been involved in plenty of conversations about how do we collaborate around any number of things over the last several years, whether it's the open skills network work that's going on to try to um, document skills in some type of common currency, academic integrity issues, other things like that. So I was very much aware of what was happening here at UMGC. And so when the opportunity came along, it was an, a chance to take some of the things that I already knew about online education, some of the things that I've been able to build um, through learning resources, through partnerships, through other things, but also to take it in a new direction to think about, okay, so what does that look like with 200 locations around the globe? Um, with different types of experiences in each of these places and all the nuances of trying to teach courses, with all the regulations and different infrastructures. And say, I tell people it's different whether you're in Kuwait or Kansas right now um, and trying to say, we're gonna do an online experience in these places. And how do we make that work felt like a good challenge and a new opportunity to grow in some ways that I had not. And also to get me back into one of my favorite cities in the world, which is Washington, DC. Yeah, it feels like um, EdUp experience interviewing Dr. Greg Fowler in every city on a tour. It, it seems like you just came up with that idea. Anyway, let me pass to you, John. There's a sub podcast to be created on that, I think. Um, a couple of questions. I know shocking they're going to come from a tech angle uh, from me. But before I go there, uh, Greg, uh, I guess you, you talked about the differences in the places that you've been and then you know, the, the, the mission of UMGC, at least how it was founded and how it currently is. How do you see that evolving? Uh, going forward, um, how much of it will be the same and how much of it will be will be maybe new to what UMGC has been? 
So I think that um, we certainly are looking at some different audiences. I think every um, institution across the country is thinking about um, how might we attract or serve different populations in ways that we have not. Uh, one of the benefits of being in the University System of Maryland is that there are 11 other institutions here of different sorts, whether you're talking R1 institutions, three HBCUs, um, and uh, the, this sort of community of learning and how we uh, grow from each other is going to be one of the big things we're talking about. So we're, for example, in large conversations right now with the three HBCUs around. They want to learn a lot about virtual experiences. We want to learn more about DEIB, so diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, and so um, I went to a, a Morehouse as an undergraduate, so I know something about HBCUs, but when you're talking about things like accessibility, affordability, equity issues, um, they have a unique perspective on how they're able to support students. So we're trying to take those opportunities and learn from those types of things. You know, of course, that we've been tied with Amazon and some other partnerships since uh, 2019 with the Career Choice Program. They've recently expanded that program so that um, more of their employees can work with those things. We partner with groups like Mantech and Uber, um, continue to try to find new partnerships and new ways to help students in different types of learning experiences. Um, as we continue to look at UMGC, we are in a lot of ways, about 55, 56% of our population is military related, whether it's veterans, active duty, dependents, or spouses. Um, Amazing. We've taught literally on every continent, including in 1993, a student in, in Antarctica. Um, so trying are people to in Antarctica, there are I guess there must be studying in Antarctica, you know, I, 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 when I heard that story for the first time, I was like, that's got to be a great story to hear. But um, the result is that as the US military continues to evolve, we have to continue to evolve as well, thinking about how do you help students who are going to be in dynamic environments, uh, where they yeah. constantly may be, I mean, we just, I recently got back from Germany. Um, when I was there, they uh, was fortunate enough to be able to uh, go uh, sit in the pilot seat of a C-17 that had just gotten back from bringing Afghani refugees out of Afghanistan. Um, our students were the ones who uh, were deployed um, to do that. So how do you help the students um, who are going to be in those types of situations? How do you support their spouses? Right now, of course, we've got the situation in Ukraine where well, students from Fort Hood and from uh, parts of Europe are being uh, deployed. So what we're constantly thinking about for the future is um, the learning environment is going to constantly be dynamic. How do we continue to adapt? How do we create an agile environment for the various experiences that are going to keep coming up in different ways for different populations, whether it is corporate learning, whether it is direct to consumer learning, whether it is um, continuing to work with the military. Um, those 200 locations that we have give us a resonant presence in a lot of places around the globe that we can use to try to localize our experience and work with those communities. Uh, we do a lot of teaching, for example, of uh, English to Japanese women uh, in the Okinawa Center that we have over there. Um, how might we think about our presence in a place like Texas or North Carolina um, that we have near or on a base and say, what about the community colleges in that area? Can we partner with them? What about the corporations that are in those areas? Are they thinking about ways that they can do shorter bursts of learning? Of course, we're talking about stackable credentials, micro credentials, and other things that we're trying to look at. So these are opportunities that I see us continue to evolve over time. Uh, I will get to stackable and micro creden credentials in a minute, but I've been following you for a while and you were talking about the tech that you're using to, you know, connect the system itself and then also evolve UMGC. But I've also heard you say like, look, there's a, there's a lure of chasing shiny objects. Um, and that I think your quote is, if you're asking, if your first question is how can technology solve your problems, uh, you might be starting with the wrong question. Can you elaborate on that a little bit and what you mean by that and the, maybe the perils of, of chasing tech for the sake of it? So I, I, and I hear this a lot right now from even uh, schools that I have a lot of uh, affection for and a respect for, which are um, as things continue to change, um, we're going to bring on these new solutions that are going to solve all of our problems. And, hey kids, you know, it's the internet. You know, it's one of those things that you go, I can't believe that um, this is the um, this is the path you're going to take moving forward. So whether it is, uh, I'm a big fan of you need the fundamentals in place. Certainly, you need a good SIS. You need um, a, a number of other tools that are in place. But um, if there is an attempt to simply say we're going to take this, and the simplest example of that is during remote learning, which I'm going to differentiate again from online learning. Um, if we are talking about, oh, can I just take my uh, lecture and turn it into a PowerPoint? That doesn't solve your problem. And that's the easiest version of that. You have people chasing right now all types of various tools. 
um, that may or may not be something that they need to focus in on. You may recall, for example, and this isn't a tech tool, but it's one of those places where I think people get distracted by things that aren't necessarily tied to their mission. Um, back when the University of Virginia um, actually fired their president, the board actually fired the president because she wasn't necessarily chasing MOOCs. Um, and I think the University of Virginia did just fine without saying that was what was the solution to how they were going to grow. So not just tech tools, but when I say bright, shiny objects, it's those sort of fads that people look at and think, um, if, if we're going to be in, we've got to be doing these types of things. So I think we have to be very cautious of moving forward, regardless of whether it's a tool or a practice or anything else that we're talking about. I love John. Did you notice when he, Greg, I don't know if you noticed that you did it. When you're distinguishing between remote learning and online learning, your, your whole body language and tone changed. And anybody who's really working in online learning has some level of distinction when you use those terms. And people who are outside of online learning will use them interchangeably. And you can tell when somebody gets online learning because they go, well, remote learning, but online learning. And you did exactly that. It's, it was just a perfect example <laughs> of, of remote learning is an online learning. You don't have to say it. You know, we, we, we all know that. But people that aren't involved in online learning, all the t online learning all the time, we have to tell them, we have to remind them that emergency remote learning is the way I heard one of my past guests say it, is not online learning, right? Yeah, it, the example I use all the time is it's like trying to learn to swim in the middle of a flood. You're not going to win any Olympic medals from doing it, but you're just trying to keep your head above water. Um, and therefore, it may be functional, it may be a mitigation strategy, but it, is not, it may be a mitigation tactic, it's not a strategy. Um, and so as we look at what we're talking about with online or remote, the, the big challenge that I think we've got now is that you've had so many people exposed to this mitigation tactic um, at every level from K through 12 on that it's really hard for some people to displace that with the, the work that has been going on for decades to create a, a, an online experience that's valuable, that's um, high quality. Um, but I see it all the time with the teachers that we're working with. So we have a number of people uh, teachers who come to us and say, help us learn how to do this. And as we begin to dive into instructional design and assessment development um, and the work that has to go into user experience and all of the various things about learning science that have to go into these things, it's fascinating to see their eyes open and go, we didn't get any of this stuff in the last year. <laughs> and, and, that, and that's my point, which is that's exactly what um, has to go into you're gonna, if you're going to have a, a real learning experience that's online learning. These are the things that you've got to be able to do moving forward. John. I took I took your airtime, buddy. You, you take back over now. All good, all good. I'll, um, you know, Greg mentioned uh, short courses and, and boot camps uh, a few minutes ago, so I'm going to bring you back there for a second. But certainly, the rise of those are getting more and more popular. We're starting to see some trends on our side in terms of um, <clears throat> gender breakdowns and how this is getting picked up. I've even got a buddy of mine who who uh, had a son. Sent him. I'm from Michigan, by the way, so all my stories tend to be Michigan centric, but <laughs> And sent him to a, a, a regional public university in Michigan, uh, had a fine experience there, you know, invested a fair amount of money, didn't get a job, left there three months later, went to, uh, went to a company called Tech Elevator, took a coding boot camp. On the heels of that boot camp, got a great job. Two years later, got an even better job. Um, I think the thing that I'm, I'm starting to wonder is how do we bring those two things together? And most specifically, right, I, I've got a feeling his alma mater doesn't even know that happened, right? Um, but the boot camp does and is taking credit for that in terms of the value of their degree. Um, do you see those things starting to intersect down the road and, and how and does the tech community or maybe corporate America have a role to play in terms of intentionality trying to bring these two things together in terms of higher ed and maybe some of the, the skills that the marketplace is espousing through these, through these other forms of, of education? You know, one of the things that I used to love watching uh, in my previous role um, as um, the chief academic officer at SNHU was whenever we're getting ready to do a new learning experience, we try to bring in uh, people who are um, practicing in the field paired with academics. Um, the, one of my colleagues there called them pracademics um, and was talking about how do we bring the industry into the discussions and the design processes to make sure we're developing these things in a way that's actually going to be relevant and not only get them a job, but make sure they're effective at the job when they get it. And whenever we did those types of experiences, you'd have the academics and those practitioners together in a room. The first day was getting them to a place where they would actually start to agree on what the outcome should be. 
because they almost never did on the first day. Um, um, one of the fields that I remember I was talking about was we were talking about political science campaign uh, campaigns, uh, running a campaign, and the uh, the academics came into the room, and then the practitioners like. You would never ask any of that stuff. You would never Yikes. expect to be able to do those types of things um, if they were trying to run a campaign. And over time, you have to bring them together. And it almost always took three or four days to do that. So to your question, I think that's really one of the places that we've got to create more of an integration of those things in real time without trying to stigmatize um, this that thing that a lot of people turn this into, well, now you're just trying to do vocational education. That's not necessarily at all what we're talking about. We are no. talking about explicit direct skills, um, some of which may be the enduring skills. I'm not going to use soft skills because I think that's a misnomer, but these enduring skills that um, are going to be integrated into these skills that you're going to have on the job in the content area. But I think those two things have to be interwoven. And that doesn't mean that you don't do the other things, but you've got to distill a lot of those things. So the thing I like about boot camps is if you do them well, you can actually gain and demonstrate those other skills explicitly as part of the process. Um, the, uh, but you have to be able to do that um, intentionally. Um, that's a term I, I use a lot right these days is, are you intentionally building out these things? Or are you simply doing something because it's always been the way you've done it in the past? So that's what I think about how boot camps do that and how we need to try to integrate more of that into the experiences we're talking about. Yeah, and I'm, yeah and I'm, I consider myself on team higher ed. I was raised by two public school teachers. My dad just uh, turned professor uh, at the end of his career and just retired from Central Michigan. So to your point, like higher ed definitely um, is the one that I think that teaches those, you call them soft skills. I've heard them called success skills, right? Um, but I think that's power where skills. Ed, power skills, right? Those enduring skills that you mentioned, but I think there's a way for us to integrate these two things. And I know you've talked about, um, you know, having outcomes experts kind of in the room to make sure that those two things happen. I, I really, uh, I didn't realize, yeah, that, that idea of um, maybe, maybe there's a mediator in between the, uh, the academic and, uh, and the employer uh, in the form of a, that outcomes expert. But it's, I, I, I just feel like hopefully both audiences are open to this. I think it'd be fascinating if we saw more of that conversation that you're articulating come to pass. It is, it is definitely a skill to be able to do that, to bring those two teams together in a way that at the end, uh, and almost always both sides came out saying we learned something from each other um, in a way that makes you feel like there is a way to do this um, by design as we continue to move forward. Another thing that I, I, I would like to point out um, that I am really spending a lot of my time talking about or thinking about is we use that term, you've heard it probably most of your life, of lifelong learning. And um, the, the truth of the matter is while we talk about that, we don't really appreciate in the ways that we should um, that most of the things we're going to learn in our lives um, are things that you're not going to learn in a traditional classroom. One of the things I think we've got to get better at is finding ways to give credit for that. Um, so you are seeing this huge conversation about prior learning assessment. Um, I'm, you're hearing more about current learning assessment. How do we turn the workforce into the learning environment and um, the places where we can document those things and we credential that as a higher education institution based upon the relevance to that student's life and the things they're going through um, wherever they might be feels like an opportunity for higher education to rethink what it's trying to do moving forward. Lead Squared isn't only an enrollment CRM. It's a technology that will allow you to optimize your entire front end student life cycle by providing decision makers with real time customizable dashboards. Forecasting, measuring, and optimizing for key activities will increase retention and revenue, and Lead Squared will lower technology costs simultaneously. Not only can Lead Squared align with existing admissions processes, but the technology will also help you innovate beyond what you thought was possible. The ability to access data on your phone will keep you connected. And when you add in the world-class customer service, Lead Squared transcends being a technology. It's an experience. Check them out at leadsquared.com. Joe, I promise I'm not trying to keep you out of this conversation. No, keep going. <laughs> um, no, I'm, I'm so glad you serviced that, Greg, because that's one of the things that I think our team has been ruminating on. I feel like there's a role for tech to play in being able to provide that continuity for universities so that after, after, uh, after the student graduates, there's a way for the university to understand, here's what this student is now going through. Here's, the, here's their career trajectory, the role that they're in, and therefore the trends that they might be facing mm -hmm. that you all then could provide proactively. Um, this might be a skill, this might be a cert, 
here, this might be a, a class that would be relevant for you, uh, given where we know you are in that. I think to, right now, I don't know, my alma mater doesn't know what I'm doing today. I'm not sure about uh, both of yours, but I think we can do better with technology and helping to create that continuity so that there is more of a lifelong learning platform. It just needs to be anchored in, you know, what what is this individual going through, I think. Um, yeah. to, and it does, and if we do that right, if you think about this huge conversation, again, about diversity, equity, and inclusion, now we're doing it in a way that's relevant to the individual student. We often, you, you hear right. that term thrown around a lot, student-centric. Um, but now if you're doing it this way, this is, I'm talking about the communication skills you're getting. I'm talking about your ability to deal with effective, um, or, or deal with diverse populations. I'm talking about these things that you are doing, but I'm not talking about them in a theoretical sense. Now I'm talking about the things you're actually doing on the job and how are those things, if I can help you reflect upon them and you know tag those skills. How many times in our lives have we been involved in a class? I remember when I, I did an MBA from WGU. Um, I think I told you that I actually ended up doing that primarily by accident. I was just trying to get an understanding of what the students were going through. And I kept taking class and taking class till I ended up almost with a degree um, in the process of doing that. But what I did find out was that a lot of the things that I knew about, I didn't know the formal terms for, but I knew, uh, but I was already practicing those types of things. Imagine what we could do if we had students who had other equity challenges if we could say, you know, you're actually already working through some of these skills, we can speed up your time, we can actually find ways to decrease your cost by, you know, giving you those instances in the workplace, your workforce you're already working in, um, as opposed to the types of things that require people to sit in a classroom for a period of time. That is, I think, the big opportunity for higher education to rethink what's going to happen in the future. Well, I got to tell you guys, I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed that we've gotten through half an episode here and Dr. Gregory Fowler has not yet dropped any movie reference in his talks, which means we have a penalty. We have, we're, ah. we're, in a, we're, in a, we're in a penalty round. Let's see. Oh, we have higher ed word association as the penalty. Here we go. <laughs> Greg and John. John, you're playing. Um, let me see. Looks like we have a new challenger. Uh, uh, Greg, as I was talking to John before the episode, he said he would crush you in anything related to higher ed word association. So we're going to see how that goes now. Um, I promise I'm gonna that was you, I'm going to give you a word, Greg, you're going to give me the first thoughts that come to your mind. I'm going to give you a word or phrase. You give me the first group of thoughts or phrases that come to your mind. Elaborate if you'd like. Okay. And then John, I'm going to give Greg to go first, John, because I feel like, you know, it's just fun putting you in the place where you have to follow his answers. Well, I'm fine. I find I'm fine if he's the only respondent here. Given that he's <laughs> okay, it's here your we go. Show. Greg, your first one: student consumer. Absolutely believe that while the student is not a consumer in the traditional sense, um, that they are uh, they are purchasing an experience, and therefore we have to be considerate of what that requires of them. John, student consumer. Yeah, I mean, I think Greg, I'll, I'll dovetail off what Greg said. They're making a substantial investment mentally, physically, emotionally, and certainly financially. And there, so from that standpoint, we need to look at their, that return on investment all the time. Um, and so, again, I definitely think of students in the traditional sense, but they are, they are purchasing um, physically and financially, and we owe it to them to deliver the best product possible. We're going to need to go to the judges and find out if that answer was too long. Uh, sorry, John. Uh, <laughs> Greg wins the first round, but we do like long answers. So I'm just giving you a hard time because you're co-hosting with me and I like you. <laughs> so number two, Greg, employee workplace. For higher education, something that is dynamically changing and we're, that we're going to have to rethink, but also gives us some great opportunities to um, get some new talent in ways that we otherwise might not be able to. This is fun because John gets to provide a whole nother look at this. John, employee workplace. Uh, wave of the future, I think, is going to be hybrid because uh, I think there's still going to be a lot of value in in-person engagement. But um, I think we've all learned life flexibility and the ROI, uh, the intangible ROI that comes with that is super valuable, valuable to people right now. Pretty good. All right, Greg, here we go. Battle for talent. Something that I think is going to happen across all industries, higher education, given the things that we're trying to do with skill sets and some of the things that the future is going to have to find itself battling with industries like Google, um, Facebook, and others, but will actually hopefully be better as a result of that and some of the experience they give to students. 
That was like an in-answer plug. for. Uh, I heard Google come up, John. Did you hear that too? John, uh, I did. yeah, you get a battle for talent. It wasn't lost on me that Amazon came up earlier in the discussion. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Off. We'll get Battle to that for off. talent, John. Battle for talent. Well, one, I think it's great that there's this many opportunities out there and that there are this many jobs. So I think that's great because it's going to uh, make the rest of us uh, think about everything that we're doing for employees and making sure that we're as competitive as possible. So uh, an exciting challenge, but we're all in this boat uh, together. It'll be interesting to see how much cross-industry proliferation there is as a result. All right, I got two more. So if you guys are tired of a hired word association, we can end it. But if you want two more, we can go. What do you think, Greg? You're the guest. Sure, absolutely. Here we go. Hybrid learning. Um, something I'm very much tied into right now, particularly with our military students around the globe, uh, thinking about more high flex learning. That is, how do we change the, the model in such a way that we can future proof experiences that are face to face for our students so that they don't end up in a mitigation strategy for the future? John, hybrid learning. Would love to see the levering of tech uh, for online to be able to consume content that's better online to make the in-person experience better. And finally, very importantly, enrollment cliff. You know, I recently okay. just um, saw a um, article that makes the argument that the enrollment cliff is not a cliff, but a slope after all. I'm, I'm going to be curious to see how this plays out. I think that regardless, parts of this country are going to have to deal with substantial um, declines in their population, even if they're going elsewhere. John, enrollment cliff. Yeah, I think enrollment cliff, obviously, are a real issue. But one of the things that is going to, uh, at the same time, this need for lifelong learning, upskilling, reskilling is happening in concert and therefore uh, providing opportunities for the space in a different way. So a forced, uh, uh, a forced mechanism for us looking at uh, higher ed and a whole new, through a whole new lens. Game over. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, another episode of Higher Ed Word Association with Dr. Greg Fowler, John Farrar. Now we're back, nice guys. Gifts, by the way. What's that? I want some nice parting gifts, by the way. Yeah, well, I always say, for no money, for no money. Let's ask you some uh, I do have a cash register button, but that's as far as I get. Um, Greg, I want to know what you focus on when you come in, okay? Because you're not coming into like a brand new startup institution. I feel like some of the priorities might be different. You're coming into uh, in a, a campus that where there's 11 other, as you said, 11 other institutions, some are ones, all different types. How do you come in? Do you, you know, I'm sure you've gone through, you went through a listening and learning tour. You developed some priorities or priority list. What did you lift up, lift under the hood and say, I got to look at this or, oh boy, that's wrong. I got to tackle that. How do you bring your focus around a set of issues that you know is going to move the institution forward when you're coming into something like that? Well, I, I mean, I think the question I get a lot is what was the biggest surprise um, walking through the door? And Again, I go back to the beginning of this conversation where I talked about each of the online institutions being very different. Um, UMGC as a global campus really is a place where um, I've had to really focus in on what's happening around the world and the implications of what's happening around the world for all of our students in a way that I'd never had to do before. Um, and that's been fascinating. Um, I, I, I read a number of newspapers every morning right now because it's like, well, if that's happening there, what are the implications and what are we going to do for our student populations in those types of places? And then how do we take those things and think about um, how do we translate that into different types of experiences, even for those students who aren't necessarily in the military? So I've learned far more about countries and camps and bases and politics around the world um, than I ever thought I would. Um, and I think that's a good thing, but it also continues to raise the challenge of wherever we are, these higher ed challenges are only going to continue to evolve and we've got to figure out, you've heard me use that term a minute ago, how do we future-proof ourselves uh, for what comes next? It was, I was looking at um, this book of ours that's called Beyond the Ivory Tower, which is the history of the institution. And it's talking about, it was, I was reading about how we were there when Mount Pinatubo exploded. Um, we were there um, in the middle of Vietnam and all of, there's always going to be another disaster. There's always going to be a, another world crisis. How does higher education think about um, creating something that really still is able to endure and be of high quality? That's what I spend a lot of my time thinking about every morning when I come into these types of things. That's a lot of, that's a lot of thinking. John, I'll pass it back over to you because I 
but I mean, that's, there's a lot in that answer, especially when you talk about higher ed affecting economy, affecting people in so, such positive ways. And you look at this globally and Google has such a global footprint and everything you do affects people in a, in a similar way. It's just a lot, right? It's a lot on the shoulders of our leaders to use education in positive ways. Uh, it is, but again, I, I think Greg's hitting on this. It's such a great opportunity for, we've been, we were just talking about this, like <clears throat> we've had to be married to brick and mortar for most of higher ed's existence, right? And therefore the constraints that come with that, that's how we have a, a quarter or a semester system and all the other things that are infrastructure tied around higher ed. But in a lot of ways, technology can help us break through that and therefore liberate education, instruction, great faculty around the world and therefore opportunities for, for folks around the world. And you know, Greg, I've heard you talk about um, education deserts in the past. Um, I mean, how do you how do you see those getting alleviated uh, going forward, both domestically and maybe around the world? Uh, obviously, uh, Maryland is true global campus uh, everywhere. How, how, what, what's the opportunity we have to make those deserts at least smaller, if not go away? You know, John, you were just hitting on a point that I think is absolutely critical. It's one that I'm talking to the legislators about here in the state of Maryland as, as we get into budget cycles and education funding and um, what we fund and what we choose not to fund. And one of the things I've said to them is we've got to start thinking about capital projects and infrastructure in different ways than just brick and mortar. Um, and you saw parts of this conversation even as early as during the, the early part of the pandemic when students were suing because they were saying, well, if I'm not physically on the campus, then I want some of my money back. Um, but what a lot of the institutions very quickly found out was that it's no less expensive to try to create a good virtual experience. In some ways, it's actually even more expensive because of the things you've got to try to do. So when we are thinking about all of these infrastructure costs um, and whether we're talking education deserts or equity issues, um, there's got to be some substantial either reallocation or rethinking of how we allocate the funds that we currently have. Um, so that it doesn't become unless you're building buildings that we can actually see we don't see the investment as absolutely critical why and what is an education and desert greg if somebody's listening to this and goes well i don't know what these guys are talking about so you've got a number of different ways you can talk about this the two biggest ones that you hear about are either there is no uh physical property within uh somewhere between 30 and 50 miles of you that may, including sometimes a community college i'm out there in the middle of the country and if i want to get a, an education um, I don't have really good Wi-Fi, but I've got to drive 50 miles just to get to the most recent or most local campus of some sort. Yes. That's for, that for people who don't have the, the funds or the means to do that immediately means that you're putting them into a cycle that's very hard to break when it comes to getting an education. So unless we talk about creating other opportunities for them or reaching them where they are, um, in the same ways that we talked about sending faculty members in 1947 to Germany to teach, um, now we've got to think about how do we send bandwidth or how do we create bandwidth um, for those people in the middle of the country so that they can get an education of some sort without having to sacrifice everything else to do it. These are, these are big challenges that we have to think about in the future, just as much as we have to think about electric cars, we've also got to think about um, what are the other things that uh, technologically we've got to do differently if we're going to create a different type of society. I wonder what's harder, bringing teachers to Germany in 19, what did you say, 1945? 1945. Or extending technology. Um, I mean, yeah. yeah. You know what and I mean? It, yeah. Now it's, uh, but these are hard questions that we don't think about when it comes to at least the way we allocate funds. Um, yeah. And for, the, uh, for much of our history, We've talked about, okay, I need another building. If you're going to create a building, you've got to create the maintenance for it. Well, what about making sure that you, as you're thinking about online education or the other things, that you have the technology infrastructure that's going to keep up with those types of experiences and um, in ways that are going to allow for the different types of modalities and experiences that students are going to need? I think it's a great point, Greg. I mean, Incredible. I haven't been on a ton of campuses in the last two years, but I've been on a couple. And you know, in a few of those cases, I was like, man, there's still a lot of cranes going up here. Uh, but we don't really have any more students on this campus the last time I checked. So we're, we're increasing the ratio of square footage, you know, to, to student, which is great. And these facilities are wonderful. But in the face of a time where maybe that's not the only kind of infrastructure we should be thinking about in terms of servicing students locally and around the globe. Uh, well, I certainly... I certainly think that a lot of institutions are having this conversation. You know, uh, um, in my previous life, I was also a commissioner for the New England Commission for Higher Education. And I was working with a subcommittee there 
Um, during the height of the pandemic, you know, a number of institutions that didn't have online programs were given emergency authorization to go online by their accreditors. Um, and as we got near uh, what we thought at the time was going to be a transition back to face to face, we asked the question of how many of these institutions intend to keep or, uh, you know, go into that ultimately through some type of substantive review process. And a lot of schools said, you know, this is not who we are. This is not what we want to be. We want to go back to being what we were before. But the world continues to move. And if we're talking about the infrastructure that's going to be required for the, the next generation of learners, what does that look like? Um, so yeah, there may, be, there may be cranes, but I'm much more interested in do we have the wiring in place? Do we have the infrastructure? Because it's going to be harder, I think, as we're looking at these learning experiences to keep up with the changes uh, um, and the simulations and the boot camps and the, the documentation necessary for good learning experiences in those ways than it is to be to replace a building, I think. You know what's yeah. interesting, John, let me just say that it's like a reverse value proposition. There's just been a couple of presidents we've had on here who go, <clears throat> we're not investing online, we're going to stick with our on-ground infrastructure. And what used to be online learning was a value proposition when schools didn't have it, it's reversed. And and some presidents are going, if we just focus everything on ground and not offer online, there's going to be a value proposition in there for us. And so you've seen this total switch around. It, what's fascinating to me is how much we associate still, all of us, I think, to some degree, physical property with esteem, right? We see a building going up and we think, oh, wow, this must be a well-off institution. The lines going underneath the ground and fiber optics and the internet and broadband, you can't see that. So you don't equate access with prestige. We equate bricks with prestige. And that's a something that has to change in a world that's moving to technology. I always think about that all the time, that there's just physical assets don't measure value as much as it used to anymore. Yeah, if you recall, um, I'm going to date myself a little bit, but in the 1980s, there are people who had those really big boom boxes that they walk oh, around. Oh, yeah. Right? Remember that? Um, these and people? Sort of this, you said these people. Do you mean uh, you? I'm not going to John? say, you know, you know, that's how I got my triceps, you know, um, but the, right. th this whole this whole goal of it's big and it's loud. But you think again about, and I said this about higher education in general, we listen to more music now than we ever did when we had compact discs and records. Uh, we uh, get more news now. It's just in a very different and a compact way. Um, we, we pack more power in our iPhones, I think, than you had, we had in some of the early uh, machines that we tried to send up in the space. So um, how do we think about that technology and the learning experiences and the things that are going to come next is something that really we all have to spend more time thinking about. It was a surprise to a lot of institutions how much it cost them to even go online in a remote um, mitigation factor. Imagine what that's like if you really were trying to do it well. Um, and I want to know what was playing in that boombox, Craig, because John, every time I ask him about his songs, he says he was playing Frank Sinatra. I can't imagine you holding a boombox. I don't think hand. I said Frank Sinatra. No, 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 no. John does. John okay. says. Yeah, I, 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 no, no, I, 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 I do have an appreciation for old blue eyes, but I don't think I'd be booming him through a boom box. <laughs> That's, that was John style, boom box in Michigan. Blasting Frank Sinatra. What, what was in that uh, boom box, Greg? Um, no, back then it could have been any number of things. I mean, you may remember the song, one of the, the ones I remember booming a lot was the song Oh Yeah by Yellow. Um, remember that one? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Of course, and I'm a huge fan of, of, of so many of the people um, who you think about. Thriller still continues to be, I think, the best bass album of all time. If you oh, yeah. It, it's just, it, it's like Quincy Jones and Michael Jackson did something there that just, yeah. every time that comes on, it's just amazing to me. So that type of music is what you would have seen playing on a boombox now. Uh, of course, we're all a little bit deafer as a result of putting that thing near our ears. Uh -huh. but it, was, it was a good thing at the time. Either that or it was the volume on the Walkman uh, yeah. that, uh, that you immediately put in your ears. I may or may not. I may or may not still have my yellow waterproof Walkman from the '80s. Which, by the way, why did that thing need to be waterproof? Like, who was you know who was taking that into the pool? I don't know. Uh, Everybody who's dropping a phone in the pool, John, these days. Uh, well, don't you, know? you remember? I think was it. Uh, I'll give you your your um your movie reference here. Nightmare on Elm Street, where Nancy's in the bathtub with the headphones on and she gets sucked underwater. Oh yeah. Uh huh. Yep. So Classic. There's your one movie reference. <laughs> <laughs> you squeezed one in there. <laughs> John, get your last cut, last one in with uh, Greg, and then I'll take it take it home. 
Uh, no, I think, uh, you know, Greg's making a really good point. I'm, I'm stuck on this infrastructure thing. It'll be fascinating too. I think we're running a, a bit of a social experiment with students coming back to campus. In some ways, we're seeing some of our biggest campuses have more freshmen than they've ever had. And at the same time, we're hearing from presidents saying, yeah, a lot of those students want to take online classes. So to your point, we'll, we'll see how this, this all evolves. It, um, I've gotten close to one of the uh, one of the regional uh, university presidents in Michigan, and he told me the story of like when we had to implement the tech that you were talking about and Joe alluded to, just uh, yeah, the emergency tech, I guess, that the pandemic created. Um, it wasn't great, right? And he surveyed students and they said, you know, how do you like the technology zero to 10? And they rated it like a four in terms of its effectiveness. But then it, yeah, at the same time, asked them, do you want us to keep it zero to 10? And it got a 10, keep it. Meaning students have learned this life ROI. So I don't know that even on-campus versions are going back to what they were because I think students have now realized like, hey, there, there is some value to this. So um, your point about infrastructure investment going forward that is non-physical, um, yeah. that might be technical, is really going to be something that uh, it'll be interesting to see how many universities take that on. Um, yeah. Great point. Yeah, I think it's um, fascinating. I was in a conversation again as a commissioner um, in New England and some of the top schools around Boston, we're having conversations with them. Um, schools who, of course, have a very strong reputation. You recognize the names of, of any of them if I threw them out there. But what they said was exactly that, which is when we talk to our students and our faculty about the experience, there are elements of this that we do not want to lose, even though we do intend to go back to face to face. So if we're talking about um, synchronous classrooms, the students love the idea of a chat going alongside the side of it that they can actually we have a conversation about um, if they are if they're listening to it um, even if they were face to face they love this idea of in real time being able to have a chat going they love the idea of recording the classroom so that they can go back and watch it again they love the idea of um, being able to have more flexibility when it comes to the different ways they can digest it, um, it things that we would have never even thought about a couple of years ago so um, for yep. most of the schools who are in that happy space of yes we intend to have a face-to-face -face version of this but we are going to continue to evolve using the technology pieces. I think that's really what you're trying to see. We talked a little bit about hybrid and high flex experiences. That's where I think a lot of this will be in. And most of the studies we've seen show that that's probably the most effective version of learning, period. Um, not online or um, face to face, but this sort of um, mixture of the two that allows for that flexibility moving forward. I think that's something that a lot of schools are going to have to deal with one way or the other. And I would have been one of those students if those lectures were recorded, it would have helped me. I was a bad, uh, I had bad, I have bad handwriting and wasn't the fastest reader, right? So these different modalities, I think are going to help students a lot going forward. It'd be interesting to see. Absolutely. Yeah, even though your team guaranteed two hours with us, uh, with you for us today, two hours, Greg, we're going to let you go at one. Um, right. You're I welcome because, that. yeah, because otherwise, you know, you're stuck with me and John and it's going to be a whole train wreck. Um, as you know, we like to finish every episode with two questions. Number one, what did we not talk about UMGC today? What do you want to say about University of Maryland Global Campus? Anything that you want to plug whatsoever, speaking that you're doing, it's an open mic for you for a couple minutes. Take your time. And number two, more, and most importantly, what do you see as the future of higher education? Uh, I think those two questions are one and the same. Um, the um, being able to really think about the various types of experiences and how we do them is probably one of the big things I'm focused on right now and trying to do them in ways that actually make sense. So um, any institution that's really thinking about its future has to be saying, what do we need to do well? What are the things that are core to who our identity is? And for us, a lot of this is how do we think about doing things in different ways, partnering with various organizations and entities in a way that gives us greater capacity, greater cap capability, greater agility. So when we're talking about learning experiences, how do we create an environment where we can create experiences in short periods of time that are still high quality, but don't require us to go through a year or two years? If, if a company came in tomorrow and said, we want to take our middle managers through an experience that's six weeks long that allows them to get these types of skills, I want to be able to turn that around quickly. So I've got to partner with people who give me that agility. Um, that's not something I'm going to be able to do internally, but I want to figure out how do we do that with oversight in a way that allows for the academic quality, but also still gives us the agility to say, and tomorrow somebody else came in with something else. So how do we do this at scale? How do we do this in ways that takes into consideration 
where the market seems to be going and what those demands are. So what I'm looking for are, are partners who are going to be thinking about those different types of experiences. The, the great resignation um, is something everybody's talking about. Those, those people who are resigning right now are not about to go back to school nine to five, Monday through Friday. They're not about to go back to school for a degree. I, I just don't believe that. Um, I believe that most of them are going to be looking for short-term experiences that have high quality and give them new skills. Um, and so we are going to be working with partners to figure out how do we do that in ways that you might not see a traditional higher education um, do, institution doing that. Um, if we can do that, then we'll, we'll be creating that next generation of what UMGC has done so well before, which is meet learners where they were rather than asking the learners to come to them. Um, 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 amazing. You said it all. I love it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been another, I would say, successful, very successful episode of the EdUp Experience, of course, with my guest co-host today. He's the Director of Education at Google, John Farrar. We'll debate whether that was the right or wrong button on the next episode that John co-hosts. <laughs> and of course, my amazing two-time guest, there'll be a third, we'll hunt him. We're going to hunt him down until we get him once he gets some of these things in place. I got him on social. We're going to find him. Ladies and gentlemen, he's Dr. Greg Fowler. And he's president of the University of Maryland Global Campus. Greg, hope you had a great time on EdUp today. Thanks very much, guys. I'm looking forward to the next time around, too. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just EdUp. The Lead Squared integrated CRM functionality will put your institution at the front end of marketing and enrollment strategy by delivering a streamlined admissions process. Capture student interest, segment your audience, create student engagement workflows, and even integrate with your student information system to create longitudinal key performance metrics you've always wanted. You can do all of this and lower your technology costs. Check out leadsquared.com for more info. It's time to go live at Lucian Live 2022 in Denver, Colorado, April 10th through 13th at the Denver Convention Center. Discover the innovative solutions, transformative insights, and strong connections to help you lead through change. Register at elucian.com slash Live and catch Elvin and I recording on-site live. We can't wait to see all of you. It's time.